I could, I'll, I'll give a little bit of background and then we can kind of jump in. This is the Light of Infinite Festival. It's born of a different project I had called Don't Block Your Blessings, which was actually inspired by a letter from the Rebbe. And somebody had written the Rebbe and basically he was, you know, listing all the different things that he was going through and, you know, requesting guidance. And the Rebbe's response just really resonated with me. And he had written that not to discount this person's hardships, writing to this person saying not to discount them, but I could tell the way in which you're writing that you're not appreciating the blessings that you have. You know, you have a beautiful family, you have Parnosa and whatever the hardships were be. And he said, until you appreciate the blessings that you have, you won't necessarily be the recipient of new blessings. And I saw that as, you know, don't block your blessings. I immediately went on GoDaddy and Instagram to see if that was taken. Somehow it wasn't. So I started this project called Don't Block Your Blessings, inviting all sorts of different people from musicians, actors, and just people around the world to share sort of their, I was calling it cheat codes to happiness, like how they navigate the ups and downs of life, you know? And how to maybe not block your blessings and what tools they might have acquired to bring in blessings. And it's been incredible. And some people, you know, would write like, this has been so impactful and, and like, you know, just having to make this video, just me thinking of these different things and appreciating different things in my life. So it's been pretty incredible. And it was during COVID. So there also wasn't really in-person concerts or any sort of conventions or anything like that. So I built out these rooms on the website and we had healers, musicians, and artists painting live. That was all around when my mom passed away. That kind of inspired me to do it. And then started this book series called Light of Infinite. It's five books. Today's, the third book came out, The Sound of Illumination for Vaikra. And yeah, so this is part of the festival, but also part of the series that I do Elevate every day. And I know you're very much in the space, inspiring a lot, a lot of people with your wisdom and a lot of things touching on a lot of these concepts in mental health and in spirituality. And so I kind of wanted to hear from you, you know, what comes to mind, keeping in mind the, the theme of the It's interesting that you're festival. telling me that uh, I didn't know the backstory that a lot of this came from the lockdown when people were forced onto their computers all day and they were searching for connection. Because I have a very similar story. I think it was, it was around this time of year, yeah, because Purim's coming up. So I remember I came back from an international trip right before Purim in 2020. And I remember going through customs and having to click on the screen that said, have you visited the Wuhan, the Wuhan region of China? And I love <laughs> Wu-Tang. I don't know what you're right. talking about. <laughs> and, no, I don't know any Wuhan. I'm sorry. So, and then everything just shut down. And... It was interesting. I'd always, not always, but I, for a long time, I'd wanted to delve into Shara B'Tochen, which is uh, a section of Chay V'Salavov, the duties of the heart, by Rabbeinu B'chai, which was written almost a thousand years ago, but it's a classic, it's a perennial classic, especially oh. the section called Shara B'Tochen, which is about uh, trust in Hashem. And so I said, you know what, no one's going anywhere. <laughs> no, I'm going to just sit on my computer every night, and that's what I did every night and we're going to rock this thing we're going to finish we're going to finish the book and that's what we did and that's how i spent the first like two months of my lockdown and it's incredible because first of all it changed my life because i actually went through every word of the book in order in a disciplined fashion beginning to end <laughs> uh in a, in a in a timely way so obviously reading stuff like that is going to have an effect on, on me and then it touched so many other people. And okay, why, but why am I telling you this? Because like, obviously everything that happened in that time, the lockdown and all the, all the obviously the, the, the people that we lost, it was terrible. Okay, I'm not minimizing that. At the same time, I have to admit truth. If I weren't forced into that really difficult situation, I would have learned the whole shot of the And then the thousands of people who learned with me shot of the may not have learned. So, you know, it's like, but this to me is like, you know, they say when, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. But this is like the, the problem itself is the solution. It's not just like make the best of it. It's like, no, it's not to make the best of it. It's like if this hadn't happened, none of these blessings would have happened. 
So it's interesting. This full festival has yeah. a similar it was, origin story. Yeah, it was like a global Shabbat. You know, <laughs> like we were fortunate enough to have Shabbat, so it's like this pause. And you know, I think of so many. I'm sure you think of all these things on Shabbat because you're like not going through your regular routine. Uh, it used to be music. Now it's more writing. <laughs> and I'm like, I wish I could just figure out somehow to compose it without writing. But but yeah, so I feel like for a lot of people, it was a massive Shabbat. It was a massive reset, a very big pause. You know, people working from home, realizing you could get so many things done remotely, but also shifting in the way we're thinking and the way that we're doing things on like a massive global scale. So yeah, I agree. Shahar Bittachon is definitely an incredible book. I think in that time, I was getting more into Rabbi Nachman, the Kutay Maran, and also Tanya, which is, you know, I lived in Crown Heights and... I wasn't so connected to the altar Rebbe, like the teachings of the Rebbe at the time. Now I go back there for Shabbat and learn Torah or in Likutei Torah, and it's like amazing. But what, were, what are some of the other Sfarim books that you're most connected with and that you think resonate it's with I the most? I did a four-day uh, live stream last week. It wasn't literally four days. Not, but for four days, every right. night I did a live stream. It was a fundraiser for, for Soul Words, for my organization. And... Uh, you can even see the little glowing soul work. So every night I did different topics, multiple topics, things that my audience, my virtual community enjoy. And the first night, two topics I did were two books, which are near and dear to my heart. First one is Shada Betokin, which we mentioned. And the second one was Tanya, which you also mentioned. <laughs> Those 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 two books, <laughs> and I and I mentioned them both as having had a profound effect on my life. I'm shot a and I really only immersed what would in, you in, in, in like I told uh, you two, 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 two three years ago. Tanya is, has been a uh, an obsession almost of mine for co close to twenty years. So wow. So I wonder actually jumping into Tanya because you know when I think about Likute Malan and Rabbi Nachman's you know the the foundation like the core teaching I guess of Breslov to me at least, is the Zamra, you know, judging things favorably, but taking it to like the most extreme level where it's all like you have to internalize, but it's talking about another person. So if you're viewing another person and often we'll view somebody who maybe did something that hurt our ego or whatever, and we view it in this way that we almost see them at that moment as 99% bad, you know? And so the Zamra is like taking that 1% and just like the moon when we say like, you know, when we're sanctifying the new moon, it's really when it's at its smallest, not when it's at its most beautiful and oh, by the way, so taking that one percent and it, yeah, it was, it was like, <laughs> hey, so. and yeah. it's yeah. which is there we Ab and Ab and the so you gotta put that in. Like, okay. Even, yeah. and so then when you have the little sliver of the moon, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, very on top. Exactly. So there we go. So seeing that sliver, seeing that one percent in that other person. Of course, we're also talking about within ourselves, seeing that and judging that favorably and kind of showering love on that. Then you're able to like switch it from like the 1% good and 99% bad to like slowly seeing 99% good and 1% bad. It's just like that perspective shift, you know? And I think that's at the core of the breast of teaching throughout all the different Torahs you could bring it in. That's how I view it. And I'm curious, you know, Tanya, it resonates with me also so much. It's and also just seeing a lot of the parallels in the teachings. I'd love to hear, what do you think, you know, for somebody who maybe hasn't learned, or even if they are, but like, what's one of the major teachings that you feel like is, is you know, one of the core epic? <laughs> Tanya is the most demanding and most gentle book at the exact same time. That's the core. It's <laughs> okay. demanding in that it will call upon you to achieve spiritual levels that you hadn't even dreamt of and, and and in that sense it's incredibly demanding and the same time it's so realistic and validating about all of our our our, our defects and our and our twists of character and it's just this really wild paradox where you have idealism and practicality totally fused together so it's uplifting but it's also like comforting at the same time. You know what? Actually, when you started off and you said that you were uh, motivated by a letter from the Lubavitcher Rebbe that you saw were, were, you know, about don't block your blessing. That's how you translated the Rebbe's letter into your own words. But the Rebbe was basically saying to somebody, 
you know, you're complaining about the blessings you don't have, but like, why don't you start by counting the blessings you do have and that'll bring in more blessings. So I, I almost wanted to stop you because you said something that was so great, but I didn't wanna, I don't wanna break your flow. We could listen to it back and hear exactly what you said, but it was something like the debit, like says to the person, hey, you gotta count your blessings. But without, I don't remember what word you used, but it's something like without invalidating, oh, yeah, right? Do you remember the yeah, words yeah. you used? Yeah, yeah, not yeah. To discount. Not to okay. discount. So um, that's such an ships. art yeah, to yeah. be able to simultaneously demand from somebody and say, hey, man, you can do better, but without invalidating or discounting or being dismissive. Because it's easy, it's easy to do one or the other. Like, it's easy to validate right. everyone. Oh, you're beautiful. Don't ever change. You don't have to do anything. God loves you, baby. That's easy to do. It's all, and then, it, but it's also easy to do the, the other extreme, which is you're awful. You got to do more. You're unworthy. You don't even deserve to walk this earth right. until you, until you shape up. And, and like both extremes are very easy. What's very difficult is to validate somebody and say, you know, like you're good. I hear your pain. Uh, I, I, your, your cause of pain is legitimate. I have empathy for you. And at the exact same time say, and dude, yeah. you got to work really hard here because there's so much more that you can achieve and that that balance is such an art and you see that in tanya to me that's the essence of tanya and you see it i mean the labavitcher rebbe is the descendant of the the author of tanya so you see it in the rebbe's teachings as well yeah i think i think that's what really resonates with me with Hasidus, learning the altar rebbe's teachings and also the kutesi the rebbe's teachings around the parshion and everything that that he teaches also and all the Brussels teachings is that it's when I'm reading it, like, you know, you see on Instagram, people posting all these like positive, you know, in this healing wellness space, all these different teachings and, and thoughts and quotes. And when I'm reading like Tanya, like from back then, and we could say, Milan, I'm just like, each one is just so much, there's so many gems in it. And I'm just like, wow, this is so mind blowing. And like you said, I think it gives people a lot of chizuk. So even if it's some tochera, even if it's some like, Okay, you know, especially when you're reading about the tzaddik or even the benoni, and you're like, I'm not it's even it's the easier book to read about the tzaddik. And I can't even it's hope easier to, be to read about the tzaddik because he already tells you that you're not expected to become one. It's off the table, and right. then you read about yeah. the, the well, benoni, and then it's like, hold on, I'm supposed to become that. Right, right. I mean, in some ways, I feel like the only way to make sense of the whole thing because if the tzaddik is like he never sinned or he didn't know if he like flipped his sins all into zikhiyo, like if he took you know, like he, the whole thing is if you're, if you're serving a Shem and with fear, but also with love, then you can like switch it rather than getting to like a level playing field. You're actually like rising from it. But if the Benoni never sinned, then how did the Tzaddik did sin? You know, so I feel like in some ways it's like the world is recreated at every moment. And this is my own take that, you know, you could be a tzaddik, like you're finding your inner Tzaddik. And at that moment, you could be a Tzaddik. You could try to hope to, continue those moments like choosing happiness choosing being a tzaddik over and over again but otherwise to me it doesn't really make mm -hmm. sense between the tzaddik and the benoni i have a very controversial uh, opinion about yeah <laughs> I, uh, hear. I think that the way that the rebbe taught tanya is different than the way it was taught historically when the altar of Chassidim come back in the resurrection of the dead after mashiach comes they're going to be blown away by the way that Rebbe taught Tanya. The Alter Rebbe had a Sefer Shel Tzaddikim, and it was lost in a fire. People think he purposely destroyed it. He didn't, but it was, it was lost in a fire. In some ways, I don't want anyone to take this wrong, because this is not really actually, I don't mean this literally, but the way the Rebbe reinterpreted Tanya is almost like Sefer Shel Tzaddikim. And I think it's because Mashiach is so close, and when Mashiach comes, we're all going to be Tzaddikim. And I think the Rebbe started revealing ways how regular people can not only be the Benini of Tanya, but can become a Tzaddik. I mean, the Rebbe said that clearly, by the way, the, the you know, the Rebbe's Sunday dollars? Okay, so, so the day before the mm -hmm. Rebbe yeah, had yeah. his stroke, which, by the way, is coming up, the anniversary of that is coming up this month, Chav Zayinode, the 27th day of the month of Adar, was when the Rebbe had a stroke. He was at the Ahil in Queens, at this, his father-in-law's uh, resting place, where he would go daven often. He had a stroke and he fell, and he didn't speak publicly again after that. The day before that, 
he was giving dollars as he often would uh, you know he'd stand there all day even in his advanced age and give a dollar for tzedakah to everyone who came by there was a guy from toronto there named gabriel aram and he was publishing a, a magazine he had like an executive magazine for you know hatsi Stasi people and if, it was a really unusual thing that he decided to make a whole issue about the Rebbe's birthday because the Rebbe was turning 90 the next month. So he came to the Rebbe and, and he said, it was, this was not a Jewish magazine at all. It's an executive magazine called Lifestyles Magazine. It's like a magazine, all the ads are like Rolex watches and, uh, you know, uh, Rolls Royce cars. So actually, I don't think Rolls Royce advertises, but at any rate, it's that kind of, it's that kind of stuff. <laughs> okay, so he says to the Rebbe, what's the Rebbe's statement? It's in English, you can watch it online. He, he says, what's the Rebbe's statement for the world, you know, that we can include in the magazine? So the Rebbe says, you know, the, the whole thing, the premise was that I was turning 90. It's a the birthday article for the Rebbe turning 90. So the Rebbe said 90 in Hebrew is tzaddik. And the lesson is that every single Jew can be a tzaddik. <laughs> in other words, he's trying to make it about the Rebbe. Like, oh, the Rebbe's so great. And the Rebbe flips it on you. No, it's about all you guys. You can, but, but then, remember, it wasn't a Jewish magazine. So he's like, well, what's, what's your lesson? Because the Rebbe said every single Jew can be a tzaddik. So he's like, so what's, what's your message for the rest of the world, you know, for the non-Jewish world? The Rebbe did not, did not pause. I mean, you can watch, it, you watch the video. The Rebbe did not pause a tenth of a second. And the Rebbe said the same message. And through their seven Noah laws, you know, the seven laws that were given to Noah, who's the, the, the ancestor of all humanity, every single human being can be a tzad. And that was the last day that Abba spoke publicly, the next day that Abba had a stroke. So that's, to me, like, really that Abba's message is lifting up the whole world, the entire world to become that tzaddik. It's amazing. Wow. Yeah, everything I hear, like I said, when I was living in Crown Heights, I was just I mean, that's just how it goes. But like looking back at it, I'm like, oh, I wish I had known all this. I wish I was knew all the brilliance that was that were in these books, you know, when I was actually <laughs> there every day. But, you know, that's how it goes. And then you go back and you appreciate it. It's all in God's but, time, yeah. you know. But yeah, one of my friends, David Ben Yehudu, I learned with a lot. He, he, he grew up on the Moshav Modi and the Karlach Moshav. But he's, he's incredible when it comes to... Rabbi Nathan's books, the Likutei Halachot, you know, the biggest follower of Rabbi Nachman. And he's always pushing me, you know, because I have massive fear of public speaking. And, you know, he was there when I was like trying to write these books and everything. But now I'm like pushing myself to speak all the time. I do a like a big dinner at Tifere Teiman down, down the street in LA. If anybody's, you're welcome to come for Shabbat dinner. But anyway, so he always, this always stuck with me. He's like, you have to imagine that everybody's going through such, you know, all these different difficulties. So when you give over Torah, like in the way that the Rebbe especially exemplified, just always bring it to that sort of inspiring element. Because, you know, the, the old school way, at least like Litve, we, you know, I went to Yeshiva in Israel. It's like some of these things, you know, you're like, well, I can't really achieve that. And then you kind of feel down and it's like it's not even in your grasp. But now I think it's just so important to focus on all the things that you can and, and reshifting these focuses. And just, I think the rebel is like, you know, getting somebody to put on tefillin and getting women to light candles and all the just different things that can, can be such a massive, massive shift. And it's crazy because we, we were waiting for something to happen on a financial level just two weeks ago. And my friend has, has been waiting like for years. And finally this thing goes through and he calls me and he's like, I never lit candles in my life, like even when I was very, very religious. And I decided this Friday before Shabbat to like light candles. And I was telling him, I was like, you understand, it's, it's the same thing with how Hashem views and it's in this parsha coming up where it's like, if your heart compels you to give, you know, the offering and it's, it's not even about what you give, it's the heart that you, that you give it with. And in the same way, it's like, it's not about doing all the th if you're not doing anything and you do one little thing, the same way that I would, I think that the Rebbe would view it and how Hashem's viewing it is like, that's bigger than everything. You know what I'm saying? Because that's one shift towards where you're trying to go. The perspective of life. infinity. But from the perspective of infinity, the present moment and the present action have absolute value. Because from perspective of infinity, everything is of equal value or of no value if it doesn't have absolute value then it has no value 
because there's no such thing as relative value within infinity because you can't have a fraction or a piece of infinity. So from that perspective, like how valuable is doing the next mitzvah? <laughs> what do you mean how valuable is it? It's absolute value. It is everything <laughs> at that moment. Yeah, I think that, you know, the Zohar's interpretation of Breshit Bara is like out of beginnings, the world was created, you know? So it's like when you look at it, that the world is being recreated at every moment, then you can really see if you think that you're going in the wrong direction, then you don't have, you know, this one perspective is like, no, I'm already like screwed. I'm, this is the path that I'm going on and it's dark and it's bad and everything's bad. And, but if you, if you think that, okay, if the world's being recreated every moment, then I can choose my reality at this exact moment and start to shift towards this other thing. And even if I fall one time, okay, but that next moment is a new moment to start again, you know? And it's like, I think that's one of the, the things that help people the most, you know, because you have to have that hope and you have to have that realization that there's always that, you know, chance to continuously choose the good because there's always going to be the falls and you can't get that, that awareness of all we have is the present moment is so useful in so many ways. So you mentioned one way in which it's useful that when we feel like we're on the wrong path, well, hold on a second, you're not on any path. I mean, the you that was messing up a second ago <laughs> is not the you that is existing this second. Start fresh. Right. But there's so many uses to being aware of the the absolute newness of every second. And and one of one of the applications that I've been thinking a lot about myself and speaking a lot to others about, unfortunately, today, a lot of people say that anxiety is a major part of their lives. And anxiety is pretty much just about not being able to be present because it's, I'm creating a personal mythology, you know, like a myth is a story, is a narrative that a culture comes up to, to explain something that's happening. It's not that it's not happening. The phenomenon is happening, right? But the story isn't necessarily the real explanation. So it could be that my body is experiencing distress for any number of reasons. It could be I'm not eating and exercising right. It could be old trauma that I'm carrying. It could be for a lot of reasons. But then what the killer is, is the mythology. I, I create a narrative to explain it. And, and, and that is so self-defeating. And that voice that comes to us with that same story just creates so much wasted time because instead of being in the moment and and with you here and now i'm up inside my head listening to that crazy myth so one of the things that i do for myself and i try to share with others is, is to talk about how all we have is the present that thing that you're catastrophizing about right now it's not happening now so it's not real like just be here just be present just right now what is happening like, and if it becomes too difficult, then, then break it down really, really small. Like, what kind of chair are you sitting in? <laughs> you know, like, like, literally make it <laughs> manageable enough to contextualize yourself in the immediate present context. And, and, and then anxiety disappears. Now, I'm not claiming that the physiological symptoms disappear, because sometimes they're going to be there for various reasons. But at least our brains aren't creating these crazy narratives that are then amplifying those physiological symptoms. Anyways, it's 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 the brain that's the, that makes everything so difficult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. That that brain, yeah. I mean, the, the, so this is oh, my third book that thought, came out wow. today. This is the proof copy, but it's called. It's called they The Sound of Illumination. They say don't right judge a book by its cover, but um, it looks like a good book. Yeah, but. this is the second one, and this is the first one. So you can, it's funny, I think Mayor K posted, he wrote, yeah, they say don't judge a book by its cover, but he's like, oh, he's I'm going to judge this joke? one because it looks pretty cool. So, yeah, he, he he wrote that. He's <laughs> like, but I'm going to judge this one by its cover because I love it. So it's funny that you said that. But yeah, it's called The Sound of Illumination, and I was just like looking in the intro, and there's one line, you know, like I wrote it already two years ago, but... I had one line that said, ego is the death of wisdom. And it's sort of referencing two things. One is teaching from, teaching from Rabbi Nachman, but on this verse in Devarim, it is like in the Midbar, in the desert, you're gonna, you'll find the Matana, like you'll find this present. And it's because in the, like the desert represents Shtika, represents silence, silencing all these things that you're talking about that are in your head. And in, in other ways, it's also just, you know, 
if we think we know everything in any situation and somebody's talking, let's say you could learn from them or somebody else is telling you their experience, but even within our own experiences, if, if, if we can nullify the ego, then we can get that wisdom from that situation. But also just that shika, like the chokmah, the wisdom that comes from that is because we have to like quiet all these mm -hmm. things that are always in our head because most of them are either worried, mm -hmm. like thinking about something in the past that isn't serving us, that like we talked about, or these things that aren't gonna happen anyway. And it's always these distractions from mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. present, you know? Yeah, I love that that teaching, the sort of thinking that as, it, as like, because it's like matana as a present, but it like comes from being present and the silence of right. trying to get to that level. Making a pun, right? You purposely make a pun. <laughs> Now, I am a dad. I, I have two kids, so it happens. The presence, right? The gift of <laughs> this moment. The present is the present. Yeah. yeah. You know what else helps you get present? It's very simple, especially for yeah. overthinkers. Get into your body and do a mitzvah. Just do a mitzvah. Do a physical action that is good. And don't worry about how you feel about it. Yeah, it's always about taking action and, and reshifting the focus to others. You know, it's like when we're, it's funny because you have to kind of go out and get help. And, and then a lot of times that's like, where am I at? Like, what am I thinking now? Is this like, am I doing better? And, but it's like this constant questioning of where we're at <laughs> that sometimes keeps us away from where we could be. Cause it's like this obsession with, am I happy? Like, how am I feeling now? But really like the happiness comes from when you, kind of like mm -hmm. push that aside and stop thinking about that because continuously thinking about it, you know, yeah. makes it very hard to achieve. There's a famous story <laughs> in the, the Gemara about um, Rabbi Yechim yeah. Zakkai, the Tana, the great uh, sage. Uh, he was from the era of the Second Temple. He was the leader of the, the Jewish people during the destruction. And he was like the Moses in his generation. So it says that when he was passing away, he, he said, any idea be, be is a derech malichan I see. I don't know which direction, which path they're taking me on, whether to heaven or to Gehenna. So it's a perplexing story because he was such a, a great, righteous leader. I mean, why would he have any doubt that he had lived a righteous life? And there are many different explanations. But the, but the Rebbe gives one particular explanation, which I just, it's profound. And it's also, it's like, it's so, it's delightful. It's really delightful. The Rebbe says, Rabbi Yechman Zake was a busy guy, and he was getting stuff done. You think he stopped and analyzed? No, he never analyzed. He was just doing. And therefore, at the end of his mission on Earth, when he finally had a moment to reflect, he was like, hmm, I never considered before. Did I li live a righteous life or not? Because he was just so busy uh -huh. doing it. He wasn't thinking about whether or not it was righteous. He was just doing the next right thing. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, it makes me think of like mitzvah lefanecha. It's always like, it's always mm -hmm. a, in front of you. It's always ahead of you. So you have to always stay in that thing. And I know the Lubavitch Rebbe always, you know, when somebody would say, okay, I did this, like you sent me here to do this and I did it and it was incredible. It, it was always like, okay, but what's next? Like, that's amazing. Let's, you know, be happy about that. And he'll let them enjoy that moment, but never <laughs> sit in that. It's like, okay, cool. That's what like, I was saying. El thing El we shoot for? Which is an expression actually that describes the ascent of the souls of the righteous in heaven, that they go from strength to strength. But I don't think a lot of people realize, even people who are familiar with the Rebbe's teachings, what that means when the Rebbe would always tell people after they succeeded with something, go from strength to strength. A lot of people take it to mean like, oh, what you did, that doesn't count. Go do something. Come on, come back and impress me. Do something bigger. That's not what it means at all. Go from one strength to another strength. In other words, it's simultaneously validating the fact that what you just did right now is considered a strength, it's strong. And at the same time saying, we want more, but precisely, mm. not because you failed, to the contrary, precisely because you succeeded, the success is creating mm. momentum to breed further success. So it's not a rejection of the past accomplishment. Right. To the contrary, the greatest affirmation of the past accomplishment is to propel you to the next accomplishment. Yeah, Dumping like down, yeah. pulling down. Yeah, I mean, it makes me also think think of the verse, and I'd love to hear your take, the Shiviti Hashem Lenegdi Tamid, I think is like, you know, one of the most powerful verses. Thinking about like setting Hashem in front of me at all times, like in that same way, like always going. But also, Rabnatan, like Lenegdi, Leneged, you could think about something 
you know, if, as something you feel is coming against you, let's say in life, thinking about the shiviti, the equilibrium, to, to be able to realize that it's all for the best and always having that sort of forward momentum, realizing like, okay, later on, I think there was a, maybe it was the Rebbe Maharaj, somebody came to him who was going through a difficult time. He had an inn, this was, you know, a long time ago, and he didn't know what to do because he was going to lose, you know, he's like, I, I don't know, I can't keep this thing going. <laughs> and the Rebbe Maharaj said, basically, like, just put, prepare as if you're going to have hundreds of people for Shabbat, you know, and just get ready for, for Shabbat, just get the inn ready for a bunch of guests, get, get the food ready for a bunch of guests. And of course, this is the ultimate right. test of faith, because if it doesn't work, it's for right. sure 100% he's out, you know. So of course, listening to the Rebbe, he's like, okay, I'm going to put my full faith in this. I'm going to listen. He knows that. So he gets everything ready. And right before Shabbat, this group, you know, they're asking around. They don't know where to go. And he's like, well, I actually, ha I can house all of you guys. I have a meal. It's like perfect. And he ends up making, you know, a good amount of money off of it, not only just surviving. And he asks the Rebbe, like, how, how did you know this? He just answered, you know, when you're on a higher level, you could see further, you know. And it's like just thinking about that when you're setting Hashem in front of you and just having that emunah and getting on that higher level to realize that any of the falls are for the elevation and they're all part of it. It's just, just another movement. When I think of my kid, who's like now an amazing skateboarder, I, I love, like I saw that he understood that, okay, this trick, he, he was in YouTube university. So he's looking up the next kickflip or whatever. And he would tell me, mm. okay, this is gonna be three months for me to get this trick. I'm going to fall, you know, and he knew he's going to fall for three months. He's going to miss him in, in, in three months time. He's going to get it. And I think as kids and with sports, like we realize that and we're okay with it. And we know that's part of the thing. It's this gradual, you know, process of falling. It's this gradual growth, but it's through the falling. And I think when we get older, we view it as failing instead of growth, you know, the falling. And I think that's like, I seeing that with my kid, I was like, wow, what a powerful a powerful lesson. I know? just did a fundraiser last week. I, I mentioned to you before the four days of live streaming, and I didn't reach my goal. And a lot of people were like, it was a very public thing. I mean, it wasn't like a quiet thing. It was very publicized. And I didn't reach my goal. And people were like, oh, I'm so sorry. I said, no, I'm thrilled. And I actually put out a video that after I put it out, people said that it was like, it encouraged them. They felt, they felt better from it. I said, last year I raised a certain <laughs> amount of money for my organization. And I felt like the goal wasn't high enough and that basically I had this lingering feel, feeling afterwards that I could have done more. So this year, I more than doubled the goal. Mm -hmm. I mean, just to make it easier so you don't have to imagine. Last year, we raised $200,000. So this year, I made the goal 500000 which is more than double. I didn't hit 500000 I hit 400000 But what I told people is, not hitting my goal was fine because it was so high <laughs> that you see what happened. I doubled what I brought in last year. So That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. I have reached so lesson. high, I would not have, <laughs> yeah, I would not have ever gotten to that goal. And, uh, and I saw from, you know, each year, I, I worked it up incrementally each year with, with the fundraising. You know, I started off as a complete one man operation. So it was just like, I didn't even fundraise. I just, paid for everything myself and then slowly i got some i got yeah. i got some common sense and realized i can't be a one-man show and as we expanded we started hiring more staff which costs money people expect to be paid right and then every time i would i would raise more money i would be able to get more help then i would be able to accomplish more to be able to raise more money and get more help and it just became this virtuous circle so there's so many lessons for me in that and i by the way i recommend to everybody uh, money is a big teacher uh, put yourself in a situation where you're forced to come through with a financial goal because it is a motivator and it's a real motivator. It's not something you can push off and it's not something subjective. It's very quantifiable. You know, for a lot of spiritual people, we get afraid of money or we think it's a distraction from our spiritual growth. It's not. It's a really good way of forcing you to grow. So I recommend to everyone, whether it's a fundraiser or, or, or some other goal that you have, or it could even be a goal about Sadaka that you want to give a certain size gift. You want to make, I have a friend who had, who had a goal that he was going to give away a million dollars before he turned 30. And, uh, and he did it, you know, and now he's given us millions of dollars. So, and end goals are good. That's amazing. It makes me think of the teaching where it's like the only thing that you have is like the charity that you give, you know, cause everything else comes and goes, but that it's like, okay, that I gave to somebody that I could say is like the money that, 
I have, you know, yeah. those meets fuck. So hundred percent. So I don't want to take too much of your time for a, a 30 minute session. So I don't know if you need to, if you want to share I, anything to, have, to close off or me, a, anything, a but this has been amazing. Midnight might have that I go to pretty religiously, which yeah, I'm going to leave to momentarily. So it's a good part off because I have, it's the latest <laughs> minion. Yeah. But as far as like a parting shot, parting words, I can say anything I want. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay. This is not really anything we've discussed so far, but I'm going to say this. I'm going to say it short and sweet, and it may not make sense because I'm not going to explain much. We live in a okay. day and age when there is more access to more information than ever before and more confusion than ever before. There's so much information, misinformation, disinformation, propaganda, absolute garbage, and then there's really good stuff. And what I want to encourage every single person to do who has access to social media, and if you're watching me right now, guess what? You have access to social media. I want to encourage you to be part of the <laughs> solution. And don't just be passive and consume information and 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 don't even just be more discerning about only consuming healthy and wholesome stuff which is good you should do that but become active and put out healthy and wholesome stuff because we have to overwhelm the ratio of of garbage with lots of holy and and wholesome and healthy and uplifting messages and don't think well, it's not such high production value. Oh, I don't really have such a profound thought. Oh, it's a repost. It doesn't matter. If there's something that's motivating you and that you feel you feel good about, just doesn't have to even look good. You just pipe it up, put it out there, and touch somebody with it. That's, to me, like the call of the hour right now. We have an army all over the world of people who have the most powerful weapon ever devised. These, these, these little devices... You, you, we, we could cause a revolution in the entire world. So if just everyone who has access to, uh, to technology will just put out really positive, spiritual, uplifting messages, we'll conquer the world in a good way. 100%. Global consciousness shifting it That's towards it. the, the positive. It. Totally yeah, attainable. 100%. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's been amazing. It's been fun for me. And I think a lot of other people enjoy it because I keep getting these messages that I see on top um, saying that they loved it. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm.